Hi everyone. Um, thanks for uh, attending the webinar today. We were going to be looking at the uh, Level 3 Return to Work protocols. My name is Brett Murray. I'm the Chief Executive of SiteSafe New Zealand and uh, the session is going to last for about an hour. Uh, we're going to try and keep some room for questions at, at the end. So you're going to hear a little bit from me on the development uh, of the protocols, uh, why, why they were developed, etc. Then I'm going to pass over to Adam Still, who's going to talk us through just where you can find them and, and, and um, how to access them. Uh, we also have uh, Peter Lock Lockhart, GM uh, Construction and Health and Safety from Naylor Love, and Joe Prigmore from Fulton Hogan, National Health and Safety Manager, to talk you through from a civil and a vertical perspective uh, how they are applying them. Uh, and also, uh, both of those people are obviously on the working party. Uh, who developed the, the protocol, so uh, they will be talking about some of the things they try to cover off and, and, and uh, why they were put together uh, like they are, covering off the things they are. So I'm just going to kick off very briefly. Um, so the protocols came about because um, the Construction Accord, which is a group, uh, government and business group that was set up to, uh, to ensure construction uh, thrives into the future with all the issues we've had around supply lines and contracting chains and, and a whole raft of stuff in the past. Anyway, the discussion around that um, at, at the Accord was how ready was the industry to return to work under a, under a Level 3 alert? And the representative on the Accord from the industry was Rick Hurd uh, and also Peter Silcock, who um, comes from construction contractors. Uh, and at a meeting on the 30th of March, which will just give you an indication of how quickly these have been put together and the great job that the, that the, that the working party has, has done, uh, thought there was an obvious need to de demonstrate, obviously to the government and public, that we had plans in place to manage COVID risks effectively on site. We couldn't just draw these up uh, you know, a few days before we were going to go into alert level three. And at the time, we didn't know when we were going to go into alert level three. Um, but uh, they took the initiative to say, actually, we need to start work on this now. So from a cash flow perspective, we, we recognise that, that uh, all businesses in the sector and indeed across New Zealand that will be itching to get back into work, get some income through, come in through the doors. But there was no way the government was going to let us as a sector uh, and a high risk sector at that um, start work without having effective plans in place to, to manage that. So there was a couple of things done. One was the, the development of some high level standards through CHAZANs, uh, working with, with, the, with the industry. Uh, they were put into place at the same time we kicked off work around the, the protocols. Um, Rick, through the Accord, came to SiteSafe and said, look, can you call, came to me and said, can you coordinate uh, our approach to this and pull together a working party? Uh, he can't kindly um, put up Pete Lockhart, who will be talking to you today, uh, and, and asked him to step forward. Pete is also the chair of the National Vertical Health and Safety Practitioners Group, uh, as well as his day job, so he was uh, an obvious person to do that. Um, and so we did pull that group together, um, and using SiteSafe's Mark Combs team uh, under Adam to, to work with the group who were putting the, 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 the content of the document together, if you like, to produce the document that, that, that we have today. Um, why is it important? Look, it's really important that we follow these protocols and these are a set of protocols and, and Pete and Joe are gonna talk about the how, but the protocols themselves are about the how. So we have a standard and then we have a set of protocols about how these need to be applied. Within that though, they can be applied uh, on a site by site basis to cover off and control the risks, particular risks that uh, the site has. So a two-man site obviously has a less, lot less complex issue than, than large construction sites with lots of workers and, and, and lots going on. So it is a site-by-site -site basis, but um, we're asking all the industry to follow the, 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 the protocols as they've, been, as they've been written and work under that umbrella. Uh, but doing so, it provides the government uh, and the public, and also our own workers, I have to say, um, assurance that we can manage these these risks well because everyone's got a family nobody wants to come to work in an unsafe environment uh, in the current situation so it's really important that we that we have these and give our staff the confidence that we're um that, that we're managing this well and then we're not taking a cynical view to be quite honest but that we're actually um aligning our work practices um to what we say we're, we're doing um so I do want to notice that this is a document, um, while it's, it's hosted on the SiteSafe website, it's also on the ChazN's website, we do want one source of truth. So 
CITES has been tasked with doing all the updates to the document, and those updates are at the direction of the working uh, of the working party. Uh, they're not something CITES have to do off the top of our head. And uh, that one source of truth enables you to go to the CITESAFE website or the CHASANS website, um, and and you will get the latest version of the document because this is a bit, is a bit of a moving feast. Um, the government, uh, as governments are because of their bureaucracy, were a bit slow out of the blocks on what their expectations are. So we cracked on, produced the document, but we've been evolving it as MB and WorkSafe and others have come out. Uh, I've been working with WorkSafe. It was very, I was very keen to get WorkSafe endorsement of this work. Um, so I spoke to Phil Parks, the CEO at, CE at WorkSafe, uh, and to ensure that they were supportive of us taking this approach uh, at the time we did, uh, which was ahead of government. Uh, he was comfortable with that and um, and keen to endorse it and being very complimentary of the effort that's been put in. So um, the way the protocols will work, they said over the under, overarching stand, uh, overarching stand standard, but there will be really the go-to document uh, for site operations and on-site basis. So uh, that's it for me. I just want to thank, you know, the working party's done a terrific job, and not only the core working party, but we sent this right out across the industry for review, uh, had a lot of great feedback. We also went to Auckland University, got it checked over by an epidemiologist uh, who provided feedback and complimented the team um, on the job that they've done. So I'm really proud of it, and I'm proud of the industry for collaborating like this. Uh, to me, this is what SiteSafe's all about. We're not just a training organization, we're here to add value to the industry, and it's been really great um, to be able to do this. I'm gonna pass over to Adam Still now. So Adam's team's been the ones who've produced the document in terms of how it looks and, and in the format it's, it's in, and he's just gonna take you through the documents and, um, and talk through some of the technical issues and the easiest ways to work it. So Adam, I'll pass over to you. Awesome, thanks Brett. <clears throat> um, right, so thanks for that introduction, Brett. Um, I think the, um, I think the easiest way to, Take you through this is to show you um, firstly before we get to hear from the others um, where you can find the protocols and the best way to to use them so i've just prepared a couple of links previously um so the first place to find them um, is that all of the up-to-date information is going to be on the chasen's website under the covid 19. so going to this website um, there is the standard as was mentioned which is the overarching standard in relation to it which you can access through this link here and then underneath that lies the um, two different protocols vertical and horizontal protocols and the residential protocols and also some tools and resources so tools and resources well for some reason that hasn't been found um, but the um, <clears throat> tools and resources run through um, tools that can help you apply um, the protocols um, it also links through to relevant sites such as work so um, and here we have the residential construction protocols and also the vertical construction protocols, which was a part of the working group that SiteSafe was involved in. So we also have made them available inside of our SiteSafe website. So I'll just quickly um, explain to you why um, they're available here as well. Under the, um, the CHAS-ANS one, we have a um, the, the full document, which is a 20 page, 21 page document. Um, under the site safe pages, we also have the same. So under guides and resources, go through to COVID-19 protocols. Um, we have a link through to the CHESN site for the standard and the residential um, documents, um, supporting resources and the protocols. And here we have two versions. So the key um, difference around this is that there is the same full version that is available on CHESN, but we also have um, created a one page document, which has got hyperlinks through to the relevant um, resources. The key around this was, um, the document was designed to make it as easy as possible for, for everybody to use and to make sense of. So this one page document um, really kind of breaks the document down into um, an easy to follow guide, um, following the five stages here of before arriving on site, site entry, site operations, leaving site management protocols. Um, inside of here, there's hyperlinks through to in the individual documents. So you can get just the information that you're wanting at the time. Um, the key, 
keep out of there. So if you're looking at the site transportation protocol, it takes you to the one page which has got the information that you needed instead of having to go through a 21 page document and find the information that, um, that is relevant. The also the, the useful part of it is um, if you're wanting to print out, print out anything individually such as um, <clears throat> such as any signage, it'll take you through to a link where you've got the individual signs which are available to print out as one pages and put around the site. Um, apart from that, um, we also have un under the site safe website uh, um, the supporting resources, and um, this is a breakdown of all of the different resources under those five different stages that we spoke about earlier before roving on site, site entry, site operations, living site, and management protocols. So this makes it really easy to to just go if you know what you're looking for and um, and just download what you're needing. For example, the sign and register, print that off as a one page document. Um, there's also the, the full document, which is available, which I'll just quickly take you to as well, um, which has got a little bit of a, a one page overview about the document. It takes you to through to the same one pager, which has got you know, links to the other pages within the document. So, as you can see here, all of the different material is all in one space um, and it's got easy click through links for that. Uh, with that, I hope that you all have a look at the, at the content in here and, and have had a read through and if not, um, you do get on and, and have a read through but I'll pass it over to Pete Lockhart from Our Love who's going to talk you through um, the application of this and what it means for you and your business. So um, thanks Pete, I'll just pass this over. Um, also, I'll, I will just say we, we will be taking um, questions. There's a, a space for you to put questions inside of the um, Q&A panel. Um, we'll be addressing these you know, either during or, or at the end of the presentation. Hi all. Here we we'll go. Yep. Hi all. Um, just wanted to go through a few of the few of the things around um, the how the document came about, what we use it for, and that, and then Joe will go over um, the specific um, pieces within the within the document itself. Um, as Brett said before, um, GM construction and health, safety, environment at Naila Love, um, and also I um, chair what we call the Vertical Leaders Group which is a group of 35 um, commercial construction companies who um, collaborate on trying to get um, consistency across the vertical space uh, for you know, health and safety and things like this. And this has helped us really uh, well to, um, to implement and get these um, protocols going along with the uh, uh, collaboration with the horizontal industry. Um, the, the protocols that we've set, uh, we set, set it up so that it could be used practically. Um, everything that we did in here was trying to work out how, how it would make it easier from, for, from the one man um, single, single uh, contractor right through to uh, you know, uh, contractors like ourselves who are over multiple big sites and things like that, that, that we tried to make it a one size fits all as much as we could. The document, um, if you uh, have a read through of it, there's there's resources in there for posters and things, depending where you sit, whether you are in control of a site yourself or simply working for um, one of the one of the other contractors, and how how and trying to make it work for in 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 either or any type of situation. Um, it's a live document. Um, there are updates coming through regularly, as uh, Brett alluded to before. The government are. are playing catch up as well and we're getting um, clarifications which we're trying to push through as well um, to to help you people do do your business because there's a lot of confusion out there about what regions mean and what um, things well, you know what's a vulnerable worker and those sort of things and it's all very hard at the moment and we're, we're, there's a lot of confusion so we've tried to make it as simple as possible and um, included in this document and we are updating it as we get questions back of things we didn't think of and how um, as we get clarifications from government. So that's what we're trying to do with that in terms of that. So you'll see we're at version two already, um, which was an update mainly around the work safe clarification of the one metre, two metre rule, which has helped us to get some more clarification about that. Um, now, the, the how the 
protocol works is that it should be developed or it should be used to develop your own plan for your own business. It's really important even if you are working for another main contractor is that you actually develop a plan for your business that looks after your people. That plan will be integrated into other people's plans if you um, if you are working for another contractor as a, say an electrician working for a main contractor however as an electrician or, or any trade that you have is that you must have a plan put in place for your business that's one of the the, the things set out by government is that you know each business needs to develop a, a plan for itself it doesn't have to be complicated it, do, it just needs to cover that and what we've tried to do within the document is um, do a step-by-step -step process of how you would do that so we you know we start at the beginning which is, is before you hit site and then even after you leave it so you can use this document if you work through it and um, Joe will give you some more explanations to actually actually produce a document for your business now, as a main contractor, we're expecting to see that see that um, plan for your business if you want to come and work on our site, where I'll be asking you to develop a triple SP um, addendum from the normal triple SPs that you make just to cover what the what the risks are with COVID. Um, our teams can help you if you're working for us, or I'm sure all the other teams will, will, will assist you in putting that together. But it's important that you um, understand and have this plan thought about before you try and engage with us because we can't make this up. So um, it's, it, this, this, this document should be able to help you produce a plan that will cover all things that are required from the likes of WorkSafe if you're asked about working under level three COVID. Um, what I just wanted to share how Naila Love have been working. Um, we, we have spent the last week putting together um, all the documentation that we need to implement on our sites. Um, we hope to start back uh, early early next week, when Tuesday for a start up and then Wednesday, Thursday, we hope to be bringing subcontractors on board as we can. The thing to remember is, and everyone is uh, talking about is, is this is not business as usual. Um, there are pretty strict conditions under, under level three, whether it be travel, whether it be social distancing, um, and there's a number of things that will um, hinder uh, business as usual progress. So it's important to know what they are, have a plan of how you're going to manage those those problems and um, work your way through it. So we've just been finding as we have set down, set down and gone through all our projects, we have developed up um, new addendums for site management plans, new addendums for and some new processes to ensure that we are following the, the uh, COVID rules, all based around this COVID-19 document that you see, see here. So we are not using anything different or any other resources above what's in, what, what you see there and you have available to you. So we've tried to keep it consistent. So when you come onto our site, it should, there should be no surprises. Um, with there's there's always some curly ones. The the big one is is that no matter what you've heard in the marketplace is that working between zero and one meters is not permitted. So any any work that re, um, reduces the the social distancing less than a meter, they're saying in the construction industry, unless it's an emergency such as a first aid requirement or anything like that, you cannot do it. So that that does put some um, some boundaries around what we can actually achieve on site. We um, so we're working through that. So what we're trying to do is is set things up. The, there's um, tracking and tracing. That's important. Is that um, the ability to um, understand where you have been, who you've been in contact with, um, where, which sites you've been to. So things like that for your for your workers or yourselves is that you should be should be putting um, good processes in place to ensure that if somebody on a site or a um, somebody that you know gets COVID, then the health department can track and trace easily all the contacts that you have. So that's one of the, uh, the important ones and that's quite how we've set up our sites is that so we understand the um, the in and out, entry in and out has been a lot more rigorous in terms of how we do it. We've got people on the gate signing in and signing out um, so that no one is on our site without our knowledge. Um, even in terms of organising deliveries for your site, We've got, you need to have the two metre distancing rule, how that's going to be arranged, all those sort of things need to be thought about um, in, a, in a quite a detailed way to ensure that you're following um, the, the protocols that are required. 
there um, there's there's just uh, there's a number of things, but um, if you just sit down and work through the through through, it, it's not that hard to um, sort out. So really, that's all um, I had in terms of giving you an overview of what Naila Love is doing and what we can be doing in the industry. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, um, and um, we you know site safe um, the vertical leaders groups, all the um, you know the horizontal people people are, are trying to help get, get their subcontractors back on board and working as soon as possible. It won't be um, it won't be business as you it was six weeks ago, but at least it's a start. And um, with these protocols we have um, convinced government that we are in a position to safely go back to work and that that is the that is the key to it is that there's a lot of very nervous people out there. There's a lot of people who are worried about going back to work. So by following these pro protocols, we are making our people safe, but um, also starting our businesses again, which we all desperately need. So that's it from me, um, Adam, thanks. Um, and I think uh, Joe's the next up. Hi, yes, I'm just, waiting to be able to present my screen I think so while we're getting that sorted out I'll just say hello to everybody thanks for joining in and I hope you'll find this useful uh, Adam can you just let me know can people see my screen now yeah looks like it so yeah, I know this is going to be small I yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in to show you pieces. I don't want to make people seasick, but I just wanted to start with an overview and to highlight these five elements before arriving on site, site entry, site operations, leaving site, and then some information for those of you that are managers, along with some helpful information here. The reason I just want to draw your attention to that is as a, a firm that has contractors and subcontractors, we might spend a lot of our time asking to look at your plans for before arriving on site and for your site entry because we're going to be really keen to know how you're not going to bring an infection to our site once you're on our site we can obviously see that and work with you on that but we want to make sure if you're working for multiple people how you're managing that risk between sites i think for me a key thing of this whole process has been because we've worked vertical and horizontal construction together if you are working for multiple people you shouldn't be having to jump through different hoops on every site so hopefully creating some consistency which will just make it easier for all of us um, so yeah i really hope that's an outcome for the whole country really as we return to work So in terms of before we get to site, as Pete said, you believe site safe, we're gonna help people with plans if they want it. There's also a draft plan on the WorkSafe site. WorkSafe have created the plan template, but they have said they don't need to see them. They don't need to sign your plans off, but they might check you've got a plan and they might check you're following it. So just to make sure once you've developed your plan, make sure all your relevant workers suppliers, your subcontractors are all aware of that plan and those requirements. So have a plan is the first step and then induct people health flow chart that you can use. And sorry, this is going to be zooming about a bit. I'm in the full if you've got someone with symptoms or a potential exposure or a vulnerable person, you can get the information you need to, to make sure you. Managing that well. Now, I tend to work off this full one because then I can easily, if you've got questions about anything, obviously put those through the chat function and Adam will pass them out to us. This is a really key element, this how people travel to and from site. It's a challenge with the one meter physical distancing, depending on what vehicles you've got. It's also a challenge with how people get to site if they're carpooling. Um, so that's something that you might need to spend a bit of time on thinking how you're gonna manage that risk uh, and making sure 
sure people understand why it's important. What I would say is if you're having to have people, it's a really good idea to keep those teams of people traveling and working together. And then if someone does get exposed, you've only got to, to stand down a couple of people for the self-isolation rather than having to trace every single person who shared that vehicle. You obviously need to have your cleaning procedures from the vehicle as well. And there's guidelines about that in the protocol. Um, in terms of site entry, people who can work from home should be, most of your office employees will be able to do that, have probably been doing that through the whole of level four. This daily register signing in and out really can't highlight how important that is. We've been given a very clear message from WorkSafe that that contact contact tracing is a really key part of the safe work and the level three and being able to produce that information so in the case of an exposure being able to do that contact tracing as quickly as possible is going to be key to us being able to stay at work through level three and heading into level two uh, so that's particularly important on-site physical distancing again as as a Fulton Hogan person if you've got jobs that you can't do or there are real issues with doing with the physical distancing please let us know uh, we need to not do them we can't we can't just choose to do it we have to not do it if we can't be further apart than one meter but we need to think about okay how else could we do it what's the impact on productivity is there a small change that we could talk to the government about will they let us do it or can we influence that for level two So please don't just crack on and think no one will see because everybody has a, this I particularly like, that so if you want to follow the cleaning procedures, you can go to the cleaning guide and get the information you need there. I think another key point really is just don't forget about our normal health. People will be distracted by COVID. You've got some people who are going to be so keen to be back at work and then others who are very nervous about the infection risk. So we need to think about our people's heads in the game. Are they still thinking about what the risk is from working at height or working around a suspended load or any of those everyday health and safety risks for us? WorkSafe did call out working from height as something that might be a challenge with the physical distancing, with scaffolding or rescues and things. So there's going to be a bit of plan. For that. The other thing I wanted to draw people in terms of health and safety, what you need to manage, what you need to make sure you've got, a reminder just to stay in contact with people about um, those who can't come to work. So if you've got people who are vulnerable workers, um, and can't come to work. So it's really great how many people got on board with the protocols from a really early stage. I've seen many versions of the various drafts that have been shared for review, and, and it's great that we've had that positive feedback. But if you aren't sure, currently between version one and version two of these, or a, sorry, draft and version one or version two, a really quick and easy check is if you scroll down this management list, and you've got the bottom of the page, you've got a draft version. You haven't got one of the final version. So that's just a quick and easy check. Uh, if people are talking a lot of other stuff in that column, you can just point them in the right direction. Um, yeah, so in terms of the Fulton Hogan expectations or a contractor's expectations, can't emphasize enough the importance of the hygiene, coughing into your elbows, washing and drying your hands cleaning of your vehicles and your shared spaces uh, in smoker areas and things like that, the physical distancing and the contract, contact tracing. That's what we're being told we need to focus on the most. Um, but we, we want to work 
we all need to work together. So if we've put something in place that seems crazy for what you're doing, tell us. If you think we've missed something, tell us. Um, as I think everybody has said, we want to keep these protocols up to date and relevant. So we need to know if they're not covering something. If something's a pain, we can say, well, sorry, that's where it is. That's what we've been told. Or, OK, let's have a look at that. Maybe we can address it. So I'll hand back to Adam and for questions. I hope that was large enough for everybody. Sorry, I see there was a comment. So I did zoom in a bit, but I, I didn't want to make everyone seasick either. Okay, hi. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, that was really good. There was a little bit of a um, cutting it out by the sounds of the and the feedback. I think um, what we will do from here is um, I've got some great questions that have come through, and I will invite um, Pete and Joe to answer them, and I'll just um, talk um, through a couple of these. So um, I'll bring um, just see if I can bring Pete on line as well. There we go. Hey, and um, unfortunately Joe's having some trouble with her um, camera, but um, she will be able to um, jump in and, and answer some of these questions. So the first one um, that I've got here was um, that for trades uh, for tradesmen working at uh, at or inside people's homes during level three is it a requirement to log all occupants' names? I think it would be a good idea um, if you're actually going into people's houses, uh, um, ensure that there's social distancing, but it makes no, uh, I, I would would advise it. Yeah, so one thing that the, um, and I'll just add to that, one thing that um, we've been made really clear from um, WorkSafe is that um, they are going to be looking for as much um, contact tracing as possible. So. And um, that's why it's extremely important to get, um, you know, keep, keep the register of who's been on site at what times and who they're visiting. Um, and also um, where they've come from and where they're going if possible, um, just so that we can get as much information there as possible if if you do um, unfortunately have to um, contact trace at a later time. It was, um, yeah, it was a really key learning for me that I hadn't considered about the need for signing out. I, I was a bit like, oh, if, if we know everybody's gone, what's the problem? But if you have someone who comes to site for an hour, like a cleaner or a delivery person, and you know when they came in and when they left, then if they, if there is a problem with an infection risk there, but other people weren't there at that time, it just really narrows down who might be affected. Right. Awesome. Um, the next one uh, that I have. So I'm just trying to. Is um, well, we had here. So, um, which one is the one version of truth? Um, so, uh, when it comes to the document, um, site safe. So, so, so the site safe Marcoms team, um, we're in charge of um, updating the con, um, the content. It goes through the um, through the industry working group for all changes and all updates. Um, once those updates have been approved, then site safe will update the document. We'll make the most recent document um, available to Chesans, which will put it on their site, and then we will also update the the full document and the one pager with the appropriate links um, inside of our the SiteSafe page as well. So um, it's SiteSafe are in charge of the one source of truth, but it's available in those two places. Also, master builders have got a link um, for the details on their site to make it easy for their members to um, access the information as well. Um, Another one here is um, what are the requirements for an individual sign off on Triple SP, i.e., multiple handling of document versus knowing who has read and participated in the document? We're, um, as from just an A Love point of view, is that we're trying to minimise any um, signing of the of documents as much as possible. Um, we we send in with the. Um, inductions we just send out an acknowledgement to say you've you've uh, you've read it with the triple sps we'd be saying um that you you have included it in, and that documentation should be done before you get to site rather than um rather than 
on site and when you're having a meeting say for a task analysis or things like that is that one of the suggestions we've had is is that just take a photo of the group and and log it and then that tells you all the people who have been involved in that particular um, that particular meeting yeah we're the same we're allowing either one person to to sign it on everyone's behalf uh, and if you can take a photograph to support that as well, then that's all for the good. Great. Um, so the next uh, next question here we have is if um, our workmates are our bubble, so three of them, um, can, for example, can um, they work within the one metre distance if it's the same crew each day and they're all a part of the same bubble? Does that mean a home bubble or a work bubble? Um, I it doesn't say in here. Um, if they want to update that, I was seen through something. Uh, home bubble, yeah. So that's a, a unique one. I I haven't I haven't thought about that one. All, all all I can say is is that WorkSafe are saying that um, you, you're not to work between one and two or less than a meter on site. Um, that may change it, but but uh, sorry, I I don't have a, a so, definitive answer on that. We have looked at that because um, we've got some places where our crews do live and work together. We've actually followed the MPI advice on that because they've looked at that for, um, so I'm based in Marlborough, that's why my Wi-Fi is so bad, um, but we've got the vintage uh, harvest has just happened and the vineyard cruise. So the guidance from MPI is if it is a home and work bubble, that yes, that's okay, but you would probably want to have some documentation on that for if you were challenged. And I would run that past whoever you were working for. So if you were on a Naylor Love site, for example, I would make sure they're aware of that so that you don't spend the whole day being told people are working too closely together. Sorry, Pete, to use your example, but given you said you hadn't said about it. Yeah, no, I hadn't. So that's good. I'm pleased that I've learned something as well. <laughs> right. Um, the next question here is: Can um, staff use public? Uh, can staff use available public transport to get to and from work? So the short, uh, the answer um, I'll give it a go, but you guys add to it um, is yes, they can. Um, some people will be required to take public transport, but the um, the advice is that in public spaces such as public transport, the two metre physical distancing should be applied. Yeah, I would uh, for the. If you look at the Ministry of Transport website, which is transport.govt.nz, they've got guidance for transport and travel for all the alert levels, and they specifically call out urban public transport and interregional buses and trains. I don't know the answer beyond that, but other than that's where I would go to find it. Great. Um, um, in here, what do we have to do to get South accreditation? Do we have to submit documentation to anyone else besides the main contractor? No, that was a, uh, I believe I've had clarification on that. That was a slight misrepresentation when they announced it is that there's actually no self registering uh, for us. It, 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 as long as you have a plan um, and you may be challenged if you have a plan, you can, uh, you can work. So there's no actual registration required as far as I know. Joe, have you got anything different on that? No, I just to agree. We asked um, Joe Pugh, who's the head of the inspectorate at WorkSafe yesterday. She was available on a webinar. Uh, she was asked about that and she hadn't heard of it. it. It was something that seemed to come up early in the piece and has gone away again as far as we know. Um, great. So um, a good question here which has been a hot topic um, leading into the protocols is um, is there any minimum standard PPE type gear required across sites do we have to enforce masks gloves sanitizers etc as a minimum PPE as a minimum PPE requirement PPE um, like that isn't short supply initially for immediate returns to work um, yes uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first then Joe can have a go as well is that PPE it was I mean a hot topic and it was well discussed um, in the guidelines, and it seems to be all the agreements, is that masks and gloves are not necessary on a construction site. Um, the Ministry of Health, and that's following the Ministry of Health guidelines. So what we're saying is that if you um, you are working 
to all the other protocols, then you don't need to have um, face masks or gloves on um, and general other PPE as per normal construction sites um, continue. Yeah, I absolutely agree. With the hand sanitizer, um, if you're on one of our sites and there is no hand washing facility, we will make sure there's sanitizer available. But actually soap and water is perfectly good. So if you're somewhere where you can supply that, you don't need to spend fortune or on hand sanitizers. And just um, just to add to that, if you are doing soap and water, um, drying off the hands is um, extremely important as well. So make sure that you have sufficient um, paper towels for drying. Um, because that's something that the epidemiologist that signed off um, was very clear about. Um, ventilation, so ventilation seems to be a sticking point um, with my guys, uh, but my guys have, have uh, and have read on Ministry of Health site the importance of good ventilation. An example, high rise with no commissioned um, HVAC and no opening windows, is that okay? So Pete, probably a question there for you. Um. It's near, it hasn't been raised, but um, I would think that if you're following all the other protocols, I see no difference, to be honest. Um, it's something that we haven't come up, a question we haven't, we haven't looked, looked into, but um, if you're stopping the COVID um, by getting in through good hand sanitising and good, good personal hygiene and, and following all the other rules, I, um, I would, would say that it would be fine. It's something that we can, um, we can follow up on because I'm not, not sure to be honest. Yeah, we, we've looked at this from a confined space point of view, which we've got some of, um, and you've got to balance the risk of we can put a fan in, but then you might increase the noise and you might increase the dust. And so it's looking at those infection control measures that Pete talked about and then looking at the other risks that ventilation might create and trying to pick the best thing to manage both. So um, it's quite hard to answer in a generic sense, but I think if Pete is able to check it out, that would be great. I'll have a look at that. Yep. Right well, we all will, but yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, do you need to advise WorkSafe that your site is returning to work? No, not over the over any other. Um, already in place protocol so if you you know the the, the normal notification we, we're not notifying um that we're, we're going back to work no they have told us that they may be doing some spot checks by phone of the businesses that they think will be going back to work but i was under the impression that that would be based on logic uh, rather than any registration requirements they're not asking to check people's plans before they start to go back to work so I'm, I'm not aware of that, other than if you're going to be felling trees or any of those things that you normally have to notify to work safe, that, that would still apply. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Um, uh, uh, Hi, occasionally we need to bring another contracting firm in to carry out specialist work that we are not able to do, such as pre-welding on pipes. What is the expectation around the new bubble? Um, are they able to enter our work site if we distance two metres to do, uh, or, or do we have to undertake disinfection? Uh, the, the, our sites are very similar to that, is that we have a number of subcontractors, as long as you have done your, your planning, have a good, um, have a good um, disinfection or cleaning regime, ensure that your subcontractors have a good plan with along with, you know, transport, um, all those things that we've talked about before, really is just about managing it. There's, 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 you need to have all your, your ducks in a row um, regarding the protocols to ensure that the subcontractor can come on board. Yeah, and, and possibly just check whether they need site induction, but that's no different than normal, really. Um, can a crew of two travel together um, in a work vehicle? Um, the clause is one one person per vehicle where possible. Joe, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So Adam, if if your screen's still on, you could go to the vehicle. Um, uh, yes. 
screen and it does say one person per vehicle where possible but then on the next row down it does say that if you've got a large enough vehicle that you can maintain that distancing then that's okay so it might be that one person has to sit in the driver's seat uh, and the other person looks like they're being chauffeured uh, which i'm sure will be a cause of great amusement um, and then if you are sharing vehicles cleaning them down afterwards but if you've got an early version i think there may have been a version that didn't clarify that it more than one person was possible Yes, we're, we're sort of taking the opinion of that if, you, if you've got a couple of people in a in a um, in a Ute or a or a, or a um, car, that's fine. What we're trying to avoid is eight to ten people in a minivan. So it's it's just as long as your transport can keep that metre uh, to to a, a you know minimum of a metre distance, then that's what we're trying for. Well, we have to have. Um. Cool. If we're working inside of the client's house, do we need to get everyone out of the house while we're working? While we are working? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. As long as you're remaining uh, the two metre social distancing, uh, would be my my call on that. Um, I um, there was something on the COVID nineteen website about people who had to work in other people's houses. Okay. Um, which of course I can't find now that I'm looking for in a hurry, but there is something on the government's COVID-19 website that talks about that situation. Okay. Um, and then um, one here, when a visitor um, goes on site to inspect the QA, do they, um, what protocol has to be followed? So a uh, building inspector or something, I think, I guess that, that's what they okay. mean, is it? Yeah. Um, once again, it's just uh, we, we control the entry and exit. They need to ensure that there's always two metre social distancing and um, that we their names are, are registered as a visitor so that, that they can track and trace. So those are the, the ones is that they must be invited to the site. They must uh, they must be organised so that they um, that they everyone is aware we try and would try and keep as much personal space so that they're in an area that um, there's no one working at that present time when they're doing the inspections and they sign out again on the way out. Um, can I just dive back to that previous question? Mm -hmm. In-home services can be delivered if it is safe to do so like tradespeople for repairs or installation keep two meter separation from those in the house. So they don't need to go out, but you do need to keep that physical distancing in place. Great. Um, next one uh, is, uh, this is about regional travel. So is travel from Dunedin to Alexandra acceptable for work? Um, we've just got a clarification on that one from the government and the, the regional the regional uh, travelling is defined as the 16, uh, 16 regional what are the the, the civil defence regions? regions? Yes, that's the one I was looking at. Civil defence regions. Um, inter, inter, inter reg, uh, travel between adjoining regions is allowable every day, so you can travel <laughs> between those regions. Um, if you're travelling across more than one region to the next region, that's only for essential work. There's a good um, good website. Uh, from the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Transport, which sets out quite a quite a, some good good guidelines in terms of um, what the travel restrictions are between level four, three, and two. So if you're looking for that, um, search it up in the, on the Ministry of Web, Web, uh, Ministry of Trans, Transport website. Cool. Um, next one. So we, we've got a little bit of time left. I'll try to get through as many of these as possible. If we can't get through all of the questions, we will have to um, stop at two o'clock um, or be shortly before two, and um, and I'll um, get send out a um, Q and A um, document addressing all of these um, points um, to the um, attendees um, following the webinar. But um, has anything been produced for working at level two, and what would that look like? No. Uh, next week. No, uh, we, 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 next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll be working on the protocols for next week. <laughs> yeah. 
So there has been thinking around that there will be something um, coming out and how that will look. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah. Um, okay, we addressed that before. Uh, with regards to on-site smoko breaks, is it recommended that all subcontractors stay on site and um, and bring their own or you know, bring their own foods uh, and drink, or can and can you enforce it as a principal contractor? Um, we can't really enforce it. <laughs> we recommend it, um, and we try and stagger our smoko breaks so that there's 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 uh, there's two meter social distancing. Um, but uh, we can't enforce. Well, we can enforce the social distancing, but we can't enforce how they have you know, what what they want to do for smoko. Yeah. So we've um, we inside of the protocols it says that we um, you know recommend to try to get pe people to bring their own food and drink where possible. If it's um, it can't be enforced, but if they do leave the site for Smoko, that they follow the same um, hygiene procedures when they're returning to site and leaving site. Yeah. Um, so that's great. There's heaps of questions coming through. Um, we have a self-employed um, contractors who's, who complete casual work. Do they need to have a response plan or can they just work on site under the main contractor's plan? For um, us, I think if they, they, oh, go on. No, no, where you go, Jo? Uh, we would, if, if, if they were only working on our site, we would we would allow them to work under our plan, but we would still ex they would still need to look at, and we would need to see how they're going to manage that infection risk getting to and from site. Yes, I I think it all comes back to is is that there's a personal responsibility um, part of the the process as well, and even if you if you're a one man band or even a worker uh, for a business, is that there are certain things that you need to have. In place, and that is, is that is, is, is thinking about the transport, thinking about the personal hygiene, and thinking thinking about uh, when you get home. You know, you wash your wash your clothes before you come in, and those sort of things. So, I think um, we would just ask for it. It could only be four or five lines. How are you managing your your processes, and are you aware of all of the the requirements for COVID? So we, we would happily share um, our information if people want it, but yeah, we'd still need to look at the time that people aren't involved on our site. Right. Um, it says here, um, would there be a link to the, a plan, a template on site, say? Um, so there's a, a just recently WorkSafe has brought out a a bit of a templated um, COVID plan, which we'll be linking through to um, on the SiteSafe website. Um, versioning, uh, versioning is especially important given that there are several places where the document will be published. Yes, um, we agree. So that's why um, we need to make sure that we've got the most up-to-date um, version. Um, so always always refer back to the websites um, of either Chazans or SiteSafe as uh, we will be uh, at site safe updating the document and ensuring that the most up to date version is available on the website and through Chazan's website. Um, and this is uh, we are doing labour only on site. Um, what we do in our side to meet the standard, what do they do on their side to meet the standard? Um, pretty much no difference whether you're labour only or supplying labour and materials is that you need to have a, a plan based around um, the, the protocols and um, ensure that the people you're working for ha ha are, are similar. So it's all about shared responsibility. Um, so if they're doing what they should in terms of the protocols and you're doing what you should, you should be able to come up and, and it's working out where that balance lies, who's supplying what. Um, it's worth the, the conversation before you start on site is that who 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 is owning what, but you go back to is that as a labour only contractor, you can, you can control this much as the controller of the site, the site controller can do this much um, and then you work together to, to work that out. Yeah, the, the only big difference that I can think of possibly 
might be just making sure that people have got enough work clothes so that if they do need to clean their clothes every night, if they're in a shared bubble and it's not good drying weather uh, or they don't have a tumble dryer, that they've got enough PPE and enough gear that they can change and clean their clothes every night. Okay, so um, a couple of questions and we're going to have to um, cut it off, but um, one thing talking about here, how do they um, uh, adhere to the social distancing rules in regards to riggers, dogman, crane operators with multiple people touching rigger gear, etc.? Once again, it's uh, back to the personal hygiene and, and things like that, is that you keep washing your hands, you try and minimise as much as possible, and um, as they keep telling us uh, uh, for, from WorkSafe is that if there's, this, uh, if there's an issue, just don't do it. It's not business as usual, and that's the whole thing we've got to keep working back to. Is that there are ways you can do it. You've got to you've got to have a plan in place to think about it, but try and try and minimise that situation as much as possible. In terms of um, we we've said is that we, we've actually um, when we're talking about rigging and things like that is that we try and keep it to one dogman unless it's um, going to be a problem. Um, yeah, it's all about the minimisation and and whether you actually ta carry out the task in under level three. Yeah, and that that's what I was talking about when I said, you know, let us know if there's going to be a problem with productivity, the speed or the ability or whether or not we can do that task at all. Uh, just just keep letting us know. But don't go ahead and do it. OK, um, one more question. Um... That we'll answer and then I'm sorry for those of you that have put in questions um, but we aren't going to be able to get to it we will be sending out the answers to the questions um, post this so everyone can see what questions were asked and what the answers are um, uh, we are a subcontractor and have been advised that we need to glove up to go into bathroom and then bin the glove then wash hands so your suggestion no need for gloves so long as we wash sanitised hands before and after bathroom use, correct. Um, I'll just have a quick go at that um, and then I'll pass it on to Pete and Joe. But um, when we spoke with the epidemiologist, the, the um, gloves is a requirement, and as you'll see in the protocols, it's a requirement to use um, uh, your rubber gloves when cleaning surfaces and when cleaning um, potential potentially contaminated surfaces. Um, but it's not a requirement to use um, you know, throughout the um, work on site. It's something that you know, you're, you're washing your hands and the drying of your hands, or sanitising the hands, is um, sufficient for for the um, you know, works to be done on site. Um, Pete and Joe, do you have any? No, not really. The 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 help follow of Ministry of Health guidelines and, and our protocols in terms of that is that when you're cleaning down, yes, you so you don't cross contaminate if you're trying to get a clean surface. However, as as a, as a general rule for construction, there there could be some things that that where they're risk assessed in depending on the task. But uh, as a general rule, we've tried to keep away from that. No, the only okay. thing I would add is uh, you might you might get some clients who do put controls over and above these protocols in the same way that we do for all sorts of PPE. So whilst we're saying that, that doesn't stop a client um, from saying that actually as part of their controls, they want you to do that. Okay. So well, well, I just... Sorry. You had something else to add there, Jo? Oh, it's just they could ask all of us to do that, sorry. Mm. Yeah, so um, we're running out of time. Um, I'll get these um, answers to everybody um, in due course. I want to thank um, Pete and Joe and Brett for um for the attendance and, and talking at this event. Is Brett still there? I'm not too sure. If he is, he might want to come in and say a final goodbye. Um, otherwise, it doesn't look like it. Um, I just want to thank you guys. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, oh, here he is. Pass it over to you. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Yeah, I saw that big red mute button. Um, yeah, look, just um, look, I just want to thank everyone in attendance for um, for coming along. I think it's been a very instructive um, webinar, and thanks to Pete and Joe in particular for coming along and sharing their experiences. Um, you know, 
in the real world because these guys are, uh, are working through this and and working through how they apply it to their sites just the same as many many of you will be um, as Pete said, look, the protocols are intrusive to the work environment because it's not normal. Uh, we're living in a new normal at the moment, and uh, it's what the government required to have confidence in us being able to work, and, and ultimately being able to work is the, the key to our industry succeeding and, and getting and getting some semblance of normality back. So um, I can't I can't iterate strong enough really that that you work work to them and and work out for your own sites on how this is going to work. Uh, and I guess at the end of the day, as WorkSafe say, we're on the side of caution um, in terms of how you, in, in terms of the work that you do, um, rather than try to think how can we risk assess our way around them. Um, so we don't want to be going there. Um, just, I just want to say one final thing because something's come up today. Um, there's a number of emails gone out for those of you who are SiteSafe members, uh, which are spam emails. They're asking you for your credit card details. Um, they even had my name on the bottom, which is obviously accessible through our website. Uh, please, if you've received those emails, we're sending out an email right now uh, alerting members to it as a spam, but it's asking you for credit card details. Uh, we'd never send that out in, in the format that, that it's done. So. Please uh, ignore, if, if you have sent something back, um, then I'm sorry, you're gonna have to notify your bank. Um, and it's a little bit like some of the bank ones that um, that go around the traps. It has the SiteSafe logo on it, um, but it's certainly not from us. Uh, at least it did go out this morning talking about membership renewals, but not asking for any payment or credit card details or, or anything. It was just a, a pre-notification. So if you get that email sent through, please advise your, your um, your admin people not to not to respond to it. Um, I've had a few phone calls. Um, so thank you. Uh, I hope you found the uh, webinar useful and uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for all involved and thanks for attending.